So welcome everyone to the first session of the Climate Resource Management and Human Development Community Resilience Initiatives in Asia Lecture Series. Our webinar today is entitled Social Transformation and Grassroots Empowerment. Please be guided by the house rules. So that's next slide. All attendees and participants must mute themselves and turn off their video upon entry. The ceremony will be recorded for documentation purposes. Our distinguished speakers, for our distinguished speakers, please keep your video off and microphone muted, especially if it's not your turn to speak. And this goes the same for the attendees. For speakers also, you'll be hearing my voice when you only have uh, three minutes left. For attendees, please send your questions through the chat box at the bottom of your screen so our team can note this and raise it during our open forum. We begin this webinar with opening remarks from our main convener, Dr. Emma Porio, who is also a professor at the Atenea de Manila's Department of Sociology and Anthropology and the project leader and principal investigator of the SICAR PH project. I now welcome Dr. Emma Porio. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Lisa. It's nice to see you and your group. And I can see Mary also. Hi, Mary. You know, Mary was my first teacher in urban sociology and the last one. Hello, Mary. Hello, I'm so hello Emma. Nice to see everybody. Yeah. Good morning, everyone, and especially to the Asian Peace Builders um, program scholars, but especially to batch 13 and also to the previous batches that I have taught, like batch 10 and batch 12. Some of them came to our training session yesterday, so I want to thank Andy Alib especially for sharing her his experiences when he was taking this course with me. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, the Department of Political Science, and of course the Asian Builders Program and Foundation for giving the to construct a webinar series that will really address issues of community engagement, issues of resource management, and resilience innovations under climate change and uh, and the uh, period of disasters, like today, uh, difficulties in live streaming, and also my internet connection is not stable because there's a big typhoon out there that is coming in the Pacific Ocean. And that's why Engineer Kim, who's joining us from Nanaga, is even having time, time uh, linking to us. So. In behalf of Father Robert, the project holder of the Coastal at Risk and the president of the Ateneo de Manila University, let me welcome you to the Climate Management and Community Resilience Lecture Series 2020, Session 1. Uh, when we were designing and doing this uh, planning for this course delivery in June, we were thinking that I was going to take all of my uh, Asian Peace Builders scholars to the communities that I was dealing with in Manila and in other regions. But COVID had other plans. It's now, it's now October and still we're on lockdown. So as I always tell my students, when life gives you lemonade, a uh, lemons make lemonade. And as Maniena, running for you in the RR said, when a shock hits you or a shock hits a community, let us bounce forward better. So here we are. Uh, we basically put up hurriedly when in September, and I can see that the lockdown will not let up. I basically called my friends in Japan, um, Miwako Hosoda, my friends in Thailand, Konsori Chai, uh, my other friends are doing excellent community resilience innovations to basically share their experiences with us. So um, thus, we have this lecture series, 
So for example, on Thursday, we will have Miwako Hosoda. We will be talking about the imbalance between human nature and development. We also have uh, Stefan Rodelius will, of the Laudato Sea Philippines who will talk about the Colorado experience on ecosystem balance and development uh, together with Professor Rare of the Open U. So we have plenty of um, excellent, excellent innovation champions who will join us for the next two weeks. So please tune with us and I hope you will you know, enjoy what we have prepared for you. So welcome. And we hope to, to the, all of those who are joining us on um, in the digital space, thank you so much for sharing your valuable time. We were originally planning this, of, we were going to live stream this on, F, on our FB page and, and, lay, and also record it. So we will do that, put in our Sikar page YouTube channel. But because of the weather conditions, uh, we're having problems with live streaming. So what we will do is that we will record it, um, clean it, and then put it in our YouTube channel and we'll announce it to you. So without much ado, I'd like to welcome and uh, thank Lisa Lim and her group and engineer Kim. Um, Lisa Lim and her group, the Institute of Social Order has been doing a lot of community resilience initiatives in, in other places in the Philippines, in La in La Union, in Tuan, in so many places. And Siroma, the, the Siroma Women's Management of the Mangroves is just one of them. Uh, Engineer Kim has been doing some study water quality assessments in uh, San Miguel Bay with the mangroves. She's a research intern with the SICAR PH, and it really allows us to have a good, you know, transdisciplinary um, uh, in, uh, linkages with each other. So I also would like to thank uh, Father Robert Rivera of the Dinaga president, and he, he was instrumental in making the Ateneo Dinaga University scientists to partner with SICAR PH and also to support the Naga City Resilience Council in producing climate disaster risk assessment and the like. So uh, thank you, Lisa, for sharing your um, vast experiences and knowledge of community resilience and leading a wonderful group of community organizers and people who are committed to um, sustainable development and resilience. So thank you very much. Welcome to the Climate Resource Management and Community Resilience Lecture Series 2020 for the Asia Pacific Builders Program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fiona. We officially begin the webinar by calling our guest speaker, Lisa Lim, who will discuss social transformation and grassroots empowerment, a strategy for promoting island-based coastal resource management. Dr. Lim is the Executive Director of the Institute of Social Order and Faculty at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Neo de Manila University. I now welcome Dr. Lisa Lim, with support from the ISO community organizers and the Women's Mangrove Management Group of Serum. Thank you very much, uh, Ina, Emma. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to take off my hat as an academic and I'm going to present to you uh, the experiences of the Institute of Social Order in, in implementing community-based coastal resource management. Let me start with let me share first the, uh, just a second. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can, Lisa. Okay, so, yeah. so uh, well, our program is entitled Social Transformation and Grassroots Empowerment, which is primarily focused on island-based communities. So I'm, I'm presenting uh, today to you our experiences together with the officer in charge of the, our vehicle project team, uh, Forrester Jerry Quitorio and Mr. Aaron Bustamante, our program manager. So I'm just gonna give you an overview of what we're doing and then I'm gonna turn uh, 
I'm gonna turn the floor or, or the mic to turn over the mic to Forest Territorio, who is the one that's implementing the project on site. Uh, that will give you more, and uh, if he can give you more insight on what's happening at the community, which I think is more of your interest. Okay. So, but let me start first with uh, why why we focused on uh, community-based coastal resource management. Uh, our institute and we were trying to uh, explore what can be done in terms of the rural poor. We identified the fisher folks to be the poorest of the poor. And we also uh, realized that um, one of the reasons why they are poor is because their resources are degraded. Okay? And then uh, we did realize that, and upon talking to them, we realized that uh, one of the things that they were saying is that uh, well, pretty much the problem really is that uh, fishery resources are open access resource. And that made us realize that uh, we need to understand first, okay, because uh, fishery resource is a common resource. And if we define commons, uh, that means that uh, the area would have no clearly defined property rights. In other words, everybody has access to it. And everybody supposed to be our uh, managing it collectively. But as we know, common resources, um, sometimes people simply just uh, see the benefits of it and uh, that they can draw resources from it, but the responsibility for it is not very clear. And because of that, it, it's actually prone to what uh, Jared Hardin called the tragedy of the commons. In other words, people simply just uh, pursue benefits without limits, and as a result also, uh, diminish the productivity of the resources so that eventually uh, the freedom in the commons can actually bring destruction to people and we see that happening in fishery resources in forest resources mangrove areas as well so uh, universally of course uh, the problem of uh, the commons has been um, identified as an issue that can be met by sustainable development. And everybody knows this already, the definition of it being uh, the ability to meet the needs of the present generation uh, without necessarily compromising uh, the ability of the future generations, the youth, to meet their own needs. And it can only happen if you uh, facilitate the intersection of the environment, of the social, uh, well, social environment, the community itself, and of course, economics. Okay, so uh, I'm pretty sure that all of you knows this already. So our solution, uh, well, at the local level, we felt that the solution should be community-based coastal resource management. Okay, so uh, as a development approach, community-based management uh, is a participatory approach. It starts from the bottom. You need to have people connect to their environmental problems and also at the same time, uh, it's an approach empowering the co local community. So at, at first hand, you would think that uh, what is the connection with the local resources management? Well, pretty much we also felt that it's because uh, in a sense, the ecosystems approach is actually, an, you know, is actually uh, linked to the notion of uh, the interconnectedness of individuals and organisms in the natural environment, which pretty much also dovetails with uh, what's supposed to be happening in the community, the, the complementation of uh, complementation of effort and uh, of different sectors, and also cooperation among the public, the community, the local government, and the private sector. Uh, at the same time also, uh, we, we believe that community-based coastal resource management, or, or for that matter, if you extend it to other ecosystem, natural resource-based management, is uh, a tool by which you get primary resource users. In other words, uh, the community that draw their, uh, their resources from the environment uh, as managers, the rightful managers of these resources, because pretty much Presumably, they are familiar with the situation in the area. And because of that, we also feel that communities should be managing the resources that they have because legally they, have, they are provided the right 
by the constitution for that. There are local institutions there and there are economic incentives that can be available uh, for them to sustainably manage the resource. And within that context also, we have this assumption that CRM or coastal resource management should be uh, premised on the agreement of concerned stakeholders. Uh, um, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I'm hearing something. Okay, sige. Um, I think we're we're ano yata na uh, nagjaka connect tayo sa ibang uh, conferences. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, the last assumption, which pretty much we resonate with also, is yung uh, presumption that the utilization of our resources should be based on benefits derived from it at hand. Uh, so in other words, we operate also on the premise that we need to satisfy basic needs and not want, uh, which is why it links to our um, own mission and vision as well as an institution. So having said that, uh, let me first introduce to you our institution, the Institute of Social Order. Institute of Social Order is actually uh, the oldest NGO in the Philippines. Uh, it was founded in 1947 by uh, Father Walter Hogan of the Society of Jesus and uh, Mr. Wan Tan. Uh, I'm not so sure if you remember him. He, he became the head of uh, the SSS at some point. Uh, and the two of them actually founded the ISO not so much as an environmental NGO, but rather a, a labor management organization the intent is really uh, to get labor and management to talk and address uh, the issues of uh, uh, conditions of the uh, poor conditions of the labor sector at that time but uh, part of the vision of ISO also is that of a society that upholds human dignity uh, sharing democracy and sustainable development through articulation of four mission uh, yung promotion of faith that does justice the empowerment of the poor and the marginalized sectors of the Philippine society, transformation of unjust structures of power, and uh, of late we have added the reconciliation with creation, in other words, environmental justice. So uh, just to give you an overview of what ISO has been doing over the years, uh, in the 1940s to the 1950s, in response to the threat of communism at that time, ISO has been engaged in trade unionism and has given birth to two uh, uh, oldest and largest uh, labor union and peasant union, the Federation of Free Workers and Federation of Free Farmers. Uh, and then later on, they went into community development, founded the San Dionisio Multipurpose Credit Cooperative Union in the 1960s. And 1960s and 1970s, I saw Mary there. Uh, ISO also has been involved in uh founding the Sloan one Todo, Tondo organization some of the POs under Zoto has been organized I, I was uh, told by ISO in the 1980s to the 1990s uh, with the EDSA revolution ISO also has been engaged in urban poor organizing and has been uh, also engaged in uh, the passing of the Urban Development Housing Act and then the Magna Carta for the informal sector. In 1996, then we moved into, we, we did some soul searching and we realized that we need to focus again, go back to our intent of empowering the poor. So, uh, and at that time, the poorest of the poor are the fisher folk. So we looked into how we can address their issues and we came up with, uh, uh, the decision to adopt community-based coastal resource management. So as part of our efforts then, we were also engaged in the advocacy for the fishing law in 1996 and later on its amendment in 2014 in RA 10654. Uh, simultaneously, we localized environmental governance. Uh, we tried to adopt multidisciplinary local research teams that adopt citizens planning and research. Uh, in involving the local people in uh, assessing what conditions they have in the community, assessing also the resource conditions, and uh, getting them involved also in uh, environmental governance. Uh, we also uh, advocated for uh, the 
operationalization of fisheries and aquatic resource management councils, both at the municipal and baywide level, uh, which have been enshrined in the fishery law. The only difference in terms of uh, what we're trying to push is that we want these councils uh, led by fishers, legitimate fishers organizations, as compared to those simply just appointed by the municipal government. Uh, simultaneously, we also tried to adopt tripartite partnership among the different local stakeholders, the local government units, the community to their people's organizations and NGOs. And later on, uh, in La Union, we tried to pilot uh, an approach that would also enjoin the private sector to be part of environmental management. And later on in Siruma as well, we added environmental uh, enterprises. We piloted uh, environmental enterprises. Also incorporating at the same time because of uh, the problems that are now being experienced through climate change. We've also incorporated that in our effort as well as gender. Okay, so where are we operating? We're operating in four bays. Uh, San Fernando Bay, we're partner with the local government unit in, in operationalizing and uh, setting up a marine protected area in front of uh, the Coro Point Management Council. Uh, our partner there is the Coro Point Management Council and the community of Coro. Um, we also operate in uh, the Polillo group of islands uh, where we, we try to operationalize an island-based participatory coastal resource management approach. Uh, and in Siruma, San Miguel Bay, also we had a presence in Culion, Palawan, uh, implementing our, what we call the stage program. Okay, so why the poor? Uh, why does, why, uh, why did we maintain our focus on the fishers? Primarily because they are the poorest in the country. Uh, poverty incidence as of 2015, uh, 2020 is 26.2, uh, which is uh, now uh, more or less an in, uh, improvement in the re, in the later uh, in the preview, sorry, in the previous poverty incidence among the fisher folks, and they attributed it to the uh, very active advocacy work of the fisher folks. Uh, fishing of, of also is an occupation of last recourse, we, we found out. Nobody wants to go to fishing uh, as a choice. Uh, they, they go there because they have nothing else um, that they can, they can actually engage in in terms of occupation. Some of them are actually uh, agricultural workers as well, as well. Why don't they want fishing? Well, pretty much it's a back-breaking uh, task. And also a very intense competition, also from large scale and illegal commercial fishers who are encroaching on their uh, fishing grounds. So to be able to respond to this, some of them do have to resort to the practice of destructive fishing and uh, illegal conversion in some cases of their mangrove areas. So of late, uh, they're confronted now with the impact of climate change and more recently with uh, the pandemic, which also affected uh, their poverty condition. So if we're going to uh, try to see it within, uh, uh, try to map it out as a framework, this is how it would look like. Um, you, you see uh, the major problems because of the competition from commercial fishers and over efficient use of gears. At the same time, that includes also you know, uh, uh, fish fund, um, setting up a fish fund which leads to unsustainable fishing and the depletion of the resource bases, which limit also their fishery resource access. That results to poverty and marginalization, which also at, at some point, due to lack of organization of fishers, uh, since they're also doing destructive fishing, that again, uh, contributes to limited access to fishery resource. You add, uh, you, you add inefficient fishery law enforcement, but that, that actually creates a very complex dynamic. And uh, more recently, you add now food security concerns uh, because of uh, the limited you know, limited resources. Uh, I heard that one of the practice of the fishers is that they sell the more um, good quality fish outside so that they can get income and uh, leave those that are you know, the, the ones that are low grade fish in, in for their uh, no, for their consumption uh, so it affects also their food security and health concerns 
there's also uh, because of climate change, the extreme weather condition, which prevent them from going out to sea. Okay, so that they have to look for alternative resources, and in some cases, the mangroves are those. Uh, we have been also uh, informed that the mobility restrictions due to COVID and the uh, quarantine or lockdown uh, prevent them from going out to market their fish. So we have we have now uh, a condition wherein they have their product, but they cannot sell it outside. So uh, that also contributes now to their poverty. So again, uh, simultaneously, if you look into their resources, uh, the reason also why we have to go to CBCRM is because um, their natural resource bases are practically depleted. Okay? The coral reef system are, uh, are um, being degraded. The mangrove resources uh, uh, nationwide has declined. Okay? And the irony of it is mangroves are your first line of defense against storm surges. Uh, fishing at the same time is an important source of protein and a uh, source of income for many people, but our fishing grounds are already at the verge of non-sustainability. In fact, 85% of our municipal waters now are declared to be overfished. So again, um, yung coastal resources and marine resources, they are common properties. Uh, and um, then the notion of open access is still prevailing in the communities. Uh, and we have to also take into consideration coastal ecosystems are your first line of defense against climatic conditions uh, and your marine resources, they're their last frontiers in terms of food security. Uh, on a positive note, uh, there are also legal instruments that are already available and can be harnessed, more or less. The fishers also are relatively organized okay? and they are highly aware that legal instruments are available and they are very active in terms of advocacy uh, for protecting their resource base. Uh, one of the fishers actually mentioned that uh, they don't really need all of these uh, livelihood assistance programs. What they need is for, for the government to help them protect their uh, resource bases because with them, they will. They are sure that they will be able to sustain themselves. Okay, so how how do we want to address them? We came up with this uh, framework of social transformation and grassroots empowerment, uh, wherein uh, the anchor, of course, are the people because we want to promote human dignity uh, because that's part of our work in faith and justice, and also in in. Uh, Part of that also is being able to harness the environment sustainably in partnership with the community, the PO and the community and other stakeholders. Uh, within the context of the community-based natural resource management, we want to articulate also the pre uh, universal preferences as have been put forth by our justice, uh, um, the, uh, the, our justice uh, roots. Okay, showing God to everything, uh, to showing the way to God, yung, uh, yung accompanying the youth, collaboration in the care of our common home, working with the poor and marginalized, which are articulated also by our value-based education and capacity building program, uh, participatory action research, which wants to understand uh, what's happening in the community and coming up with sustainable approaches that can uh, uplift their conditions. Uh, linking them to um, networking and advocacy uh, so that they can uh, avail of um, whatever it is that support that can be given by the government and other institutions, uh, empowering them through community organizing, uh, also at the same time teaching them how to manage their resources sustainably and also adapt to climate change and disaster, and of course uh, since they would need to also sustain all of these efforts, uh, trying to also come up with ways by which we can uh, stimulate social enterprises that are eco-friendly. Okay, so, um, one of the uh, one of our programs wherein uh, this framework 
is actually adopted is our project in Siruma Camarines Sur, uh, the video of which had been shown to you earlier. And uh, at this point, I'm going to ask Forester Jerry Tutorio to share with you um, their experiences in terms of uh, implementing this program. Jerry? Good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dean, and good morning, uh, Doc Emma. So I share to you the learning experience on mangrove rehabilitation and conservation. Jerry, show your face, please. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jerry. So I, uh, uh, the mangrove rehabilitation and quality of Siruma in the province of Camarines Sur, Philippines. So the project was entitled uh, Facilitating Mangrove Management in Siruma Kamsur. And it was started in 2014 up to 2018, funded with a project partner of Forest Foundation Philippines. And in 2019, up to date, ISO is still continuing the project implementation in the area. Our project site in Siruma, considered a sport class municipality in Bicol region, located in the province of Camarines Sur at the east of the Philippines, facing the Pacific Ocean. It has a land, a total land area of 14,000 hectares and has politically jurisdiction over 22 barangays, subdivided into uh, 12 of which are coastal areas, five of them are upland and two island barangays separate, uh, separated in the main island of Siruma. Next. Based on the generated uh, ISO map of uh, ISO during the Pisirea in 2015, among these 22 barangay, there are 16 of these are covered with the mangrove forest, occupied area of 1,020 hectares of mangrove forest. As a coastal community, the residents of Siruma are largely dependent on the marine, coastal, and, marine and coastal resources for their livelihood. These natural resources also help to adapt to climate change. So the, therefore, the sustainability of these resources is crucial to be able for their survival. Next, please. So here are the, the following program component under the stage program of the ISO. First is the participatory action research, where, whereas the con, uh, consciousness of the effort to involve stakeholders and key actors in the research process. Again, FAR adopts a participatory action research, adopt a bottom-up research strategy by ensuring that the stakeholders are more involved in the interactive, educational, and empowering way. So here, the, the composite team that has been formed as local research team of Siroma, which together with the members of Fisher Folk Association, the local communities, the local government units, the national government agencies, and the state universities and colleges. So the PCREA as a tool, as a tool of uh, PAR, uh, used in resource appraisal or uh, to analyze the status of con or condition of the national. It harnessed the participation of the stakeholders in gathering and analyzing the environmental, the ecological, social, and economic information about the management area. It also focuses on the resources assessment from the perspective of the local resource users. Next, please. In forming the local research team uh, during the project implementation, it comprised with the major community stakeholders and key hold key actors that are being formed. And it took in the data collection and analysis. As a function of this, uh, they determined the current status of the mangrove forest in the area. It also analyzing the causes and effect of the mangrove destruction 
and to come up with the appropriate measurements to address the destruction of mangrove forest in the area. Next, please. And the importance of the local research team is at advantages to the project and the community because uh, by them serve as means or catalyst which the research skills of local key actors are developed during the entire research process. And uh, it, uh, it sensitized the local stakeholders on the issues and effects on mangrove degradation. Uh, they are also ensured to conduct periodic participation monitoring of the impacts of conservation and enhancement effort in the area that they have been assessed. Also instill the sense of ownership of the research outcome uh, among the stakeholders and develop their sense of responsibility among the management by the existing limited resources. Next, please. So it also uh, advantages to the local stakeholders because they are gained the person experience and knowledge on the status of natural resources and community issues. They become aware on the community problems with the area and added the knowledge and skill to the community members in conducting technical researches like the PBCNA and the PCREA. Next, please. So here are the common uh, methods that we are used in Siruma as part of the PCREA. So the secondary data gathering, the participant observation, the semi-structured uh, interviews, the transect walk household survey, the resource ecological assessment, focus on uh, mangrove assessment of flora and fauna, the participatory community mapping and profiling, and scoring and ranking of issues and problems. Next, please. So here are the uh, tools that we are used in uh, project implementation though. So the semi-structured uh, interviews. So we are using the key informant interviews or the KII and the focus group discussions. Uh, we are gathering the information from the response, uh, the, uh, the understanding on the community perceptions and their values and attitudes in the area. And the transect walk, so the, the transect walk, uh, the household survey, the resource ecological, the resource ecological uh, assessment, uh, focus on mangrove uh, assessment on flora and fauna to assess the biodiversity and check the current condition of the mangrove areas. Next, please. Then the community resource profiling, uh, it involves the target community in mapping out the desired data. Particularly, uh, they, they put the map features like topographic features, the important infrastructure or other um, man-made object, the natural resources and utilization pattern, and also the hazard event uh, that uh, uh, put in, in uh, history of their area. Next, please. So these are the GIS map of mangrove areas, fish pond, and reforestation areas in uh, Siruma uh, done by the ISO in 2016. So by establishing this uh, database system and generating maps is used for planning and decision making. They are also used this uh, by the LGU for their clue. Next, please. And lastly is the scoring and issue ranking. This tool rank, uh, rank the issues and problems identified by the locals and uh, identify these, which issues and problems to be prioritized and need to for the immediate action. 
Next, please. So the insight for the PC Rea. So most of the mangrove studies focus on the biodiversity of mangrove flora, uh, but very dealt with the systematic inventory on uh, fauna, including the birds, mammals, reptiles, insects, and amphibians. So these are uh, a need to train a technical working group that would uh, crop the conservation measure just to ensure the sustainability of mangroves and their shape organism. So this group can be compromised comprised of the local uh, committee stakeholders and key actors. So the local uh, stakeholders can also assess the ecological biodiversity of mangrove ecosystem that they provide, uh, provide systematic uh, tool guide and base. Next, please. So this picture, uh, it's more importantly, uh, participatory action research can serve as a basis for the future uh, management initiative and for planning purposes. Next, please. So the second uh, program component is the community mobilization, where the solid community organizing as the strategy for the active participation and involvement uh, involvement of the local communities during project implementation. So basically the local communities are the key actors to become more successful in this initiative on mangrove conservation and rehabilitation. They also strengthen the, the relationship between the people and the mangroves to easily understand the benefits of the mangrove. From the uh, we are uh, six uh, fishers organization formed and actively participated in CBCRM program of uh, the ISO. Next, please. So the third part is the capacity building where we conducted the trainings and seminars to improve the community's technical skills and knowledge on mangrove conservation, and also dovetail for the ISO uh, vision and mission goal. Next, please. And the fourth one for the program uh, component is the environmental protection and management uh, focus on mangrove reforestation. So we are uh, established the six mangrove nurseries and all of these are locally uh, managed by the Fisher Folk Organization. And we are produced more than 100,000 seedlings with at least five to seven various mangrove species annually. And uh, we discovered 25 uh, mangrove species and uh, identified by the local communities. And which one of them, uh, one of these are critically endangered mangrove species based on uh, DAO of DNR. So with these, uh, they are locally, lo the local communities is actively participated in seedling production and day-to-day -day operation of the nurseries. In the case of Siruma, uh, the community member selected areas during the nursery establishment used to be idle, unproductive, and unwanted areas filled with solid waste. But then uh, these were cleaned and transformed into mangrove nurseries. Next, please. So we also conduct uh, the weekly patrolling and monitoring of uh, mangrove areas to document the growth and development of the outplanted seedlings and also assure the survivability of uh, these outplanted seedlings against human destruction. So also the, the Fisher Folk Association is also have uh, IEC effort from their respective barangay and doing the collaboration with the LGU addressing to decrease or uh, eliminate the illegal activities in the mangrove areas of Siruma. Next is the fifth component is the alternative livelihood where it's sustained for the food security of the fisher folk uh, and local community partners 
in 2019, uh, Samba is one of the Fisher Folk Association assisted by the ISO, uh, piloted the aqua silviculture enterprise while they're simultaneously experimenting uh, the reversion of AUU fish pond uh, with a tripartite partnership of the LGU, the Fisher Folk Organization, uh, the ISO, and the DENR. Next, please. And the last component is the networking and linkaging. We're uh, continuing the partnership and commitment building among the project partners, the, the LGU, the POs, and the national government agencies. Uh, with this also, we are doing the lobbying of uh, resolutions and series of dialogues for policy making and decision making. And uh, as part of the uh, partic uh, active participation of the local communities on annual coastal cleanup and uh, started also the IEC campaign for the protection and conservation of mangrove areas, tapping with the youth of Siruma. And lastly, uh, last June of 2020, uh, Siruma mangrove area was recognized as one of the Bicol region's best managed uh, mangrove conservation sites and uh, considered as a best practice model for existing and future mangrove protection initiative in the first ever uh, best mangrove award competition organized by the DNR Region 5 in Bicol region. Next, please. So I'll give to Dr. Lim for the next slide. Okay. Um, this is uh, one of the examples of what we're doing at a local area. And uh, that for me highlights also the role of ISO as a CBCRM practitioner. Um, so the first, the first role that we see as a CBCRM practitioner is that of exploring alternative options for localizing sustainable development. Uh, many of our approaches actually are, are formulated at the national level, but we need to be able to bring it down to the community so that they would also be engaged in uh, activities that would promote sustainable development in the long run. Another role that we, th uh, we think uh, we should be taking as NGO workers and as uh, CBCRM practitioner is that of promoting people's empowerment also through values formation and capacity building. Uh, we noted one of our learnings that we cannot really separate capacity building with values formation because uh, there are certain values that have been formed in the community that uh, are products of their uh, long experiences in terms of unsustainable, uh, no, unsustainable uh, practices also. Uh, but they do have certain certain cultural practices that initially promotes uh, conservation and also protection of their own resources. We need to be able to uh, no, we need to be able to also bring that back into the picture uh, and, and getting them also involved in these activities. Uh, another role that we see for ourselves is that of bridging scientific knowledge production, dissemination, and practical knowledge application. So uh, for the most part, we realize that um, particularly in terms of studies and uh, in terms also of academic exercises, we became focused primarily on scientific production of knowledge. But at the same time, we, we, we somehow uh, marginalize knowledge application also for the community. And that's what we want to bring in. Uh, because we, we noted that in the community, while some of their knowledge, their common sense knowledge, may not be uh, categorized as scientific, uh, when, when you actively probe them, uh, there are certain parallelisms that can be brought together so that they would be able to come up with uh, some approaches in terms of sustainable development. Okay. Another role is that of expanding social capital of the fishers, both in terms of bridging capital by linking them to the national agencies and LGUs that have resources that can help them also in terms of uh, su uh, sustaining their efforts at the community as well as get them to participate in local governance. And we also expand social capital 
by developing bonding capital among the local community members, uh, the different people's organization also. And we do that through multi-layer community organizing, grassroots organizing, alliance building at the local level, and federation building at the uh, sub-regional or regional level. Uh, of course, the practice of CBCRM is not without issues, and we're still grappling with them at, the, at present. One of them is that persistence of open access view in, in terms of common grounds. Uh, although we have a lot of laws uh, that says that we're protecting these common grounds and that we're limited access, uh, the perception of the community is that it's still uh, an open resource, okay? And everybody can take uh, take something from it without necessarily assuming responsibility. So that's also part of the information education uh, efforts that we're doing. Uh, in terms of prioritization, uh, in terms of uh, implementation of coastal resource management, we sometimes have to grapple also with uh, what will be our priority. Should it be the preservation of resources for the future, which means also limiting access or cutting uh, or completely closing uh, protected areas from uh, people, or do we also uh, at least allow limited and managed use of resource? Uh, some of the NGOs that we're working with are actually now piloting managed access to uh, protected resources uh, because we do realize that if, if you don't give them access to those, then eventually uh, whatever efforts that you do in terms of preservation, that would not really be sustainable in the long run. Um, Another concern is sustainability. Do we go for maximum sustainable yield? In other words, ensuring that, uh, for example, species can 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 be um, can promote or propagate itself in the future, or do we maximize uh, fish catch, or do we maximize also productivity of the area? Uh, long-term sustainability. Are we focusing on long-term sustainability of the community, which means also reducing access to certain resources that are in, uh, that are important for their livelihood or for that matter also address short-term survival uh, that would earn them uh, short-term income. The climate factor is also an issue. Uh, in terms of resource valuation, how do we cost implementation of uh, community-based coastal resource management? Because we do know that there are certain resources uh, which uh, would not be able to lend itself uh, to economic valuation immediately, like for example, mangroves, coral reefs, etc. cetera. Uh, we also have to grapple with um, more or less uh, working with government as policymakers and law enforcers, uh, basically uh, civil society engagement. But so because at some point, fishery law enforcement would require uh, government to take an active role in terms of regulatory uh, ano, uh, concerns. But on the other hand, uh, as a civil society organization, we also need to look at the reasons why, for example, fisher folk would engage in illegal activity. So how do we balance the two? And then, of course, lastly, citizen science. Should we be concerned with knowledge production that would allow us to understand better the community? Or would we promote community-based knowledge utilization? So, uh, all of this, uh, we, we, in terms of practice, we try to address it as, as we see them. Uh, there would be some, uh, sometimes, we have to, sometimes we have to balance it. Like, for example, in terms of community-based knowledge utilization, uh, it, it takes a very long time, but we need to immediately address the situation as we see them. Like, for example, the degradation of uh, marine protected areas or mangrove areas. But then again, we need also to look into uh, the knowledge of the community that needs to be addressed, and some of them have to be reoriented at some point. So in the end, uh, well, we see our program, not just that of doing research or program with the people, but rather uh, our effort is, is part of a much broader goal of people empowerment. Uh, this is generally what we are we, we are doing. So we are hoping that we can simply just uh, talk talk about it um, in in more of um, I don't know, kind of exchange of ideas at this point. Uh, some of your questions we have we 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 also um, saw them and uh, we have some answers to them. But uh, we'll open the floor first for this open floor. So that's all, folks. Dios mahabalos ang voice. Maraming salamat.
So if you have some questions or clarification. Maybe Ina, are we having um, the response first? Let's have, um, let's now call on Engineer Kim. So Miko, can you present the slide? Engineer Kim is the chairperson and the and faculty at the Civil Engineering Department of Atenea de Naga University. That's in Bicol region, in Ciro, near Siruma. Um, I now welcome Engineer Kim to give the commentary and response to the lecture. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ina. Is my reception clear? Yes, Ms. Kim. Okay. So thank you uh, again. Good morning, everyone. I agree with Dr. Lisa that, that transferring the power to the community is really an important, with bridging awareness, scientific knowledge, and community development, among others, as important milestones to ensure sustainability and community resilience in Apple. In relation to that community-based coastal resource management approach, as a Colana and residing near the bay, let me briefly present San Miguel Bay with my own perspective. So I'll give a primer for three coastal communities situated along the, the bay and their different status in terms of mangrove cover and resilience specific to the recent typhoon Kita. So you have Palabanga, a first class coastal municipality along San Miguel Bay and Siruma, just what like uh, Dr. Lisa already presented. Next slide, please. This is uh, a comparative map of Barangay or the village of Balongay, together with adjacent Punta Tarawal in the municipality of Palabang. It lies along the banks of Libanan River, adjoined by the Bicol River. The mangrove cover is reflected in the photos for 2006 and 2019. Whenever there's a typhoon, both villagers of Balongay and Punta Tarawal have to evacuate forcefully to an elementary school approximately five kilometers away, leaving their houses to typhoon's mercy. That, that's how awful the situation in, in this coastal community are. Next slide, please. Now, this is a, a photo of a mangrove forest in Kagsao, Calabanga. There is already a mangrove forest in, in Kagsao, and it is also in the municipality of Calabanga. It is already attracting local tourists. And thanks to the collective effort of the LGU, NGOs, and different academic institutions and local groups, the reforestation project were able to revitalize the interest of local people in the mangroves, as well as ecotourism campaign. They also have an evacuation center in the village already. So people don't have to, to go far from, from their homes whenever there's a typhoon, specifically the recently concluded typhoon Pinta. Next slide, please. Now, this is the uh, this is one picture of the nursery which was presented by uh, Forrester Jerry earlier. It's a community-based mangrove nursery in the municipality of Ciro. So I got that from ISO. Unlike the previous coastal communities, uh, Punta Tarawal, Balongkay, and Kagsao, Siruma already have their nursery. So the other two coastal communities don't have their nursery yet. They're only dependent on volunteers bringing their propagules or their seeding. So as was also said by Forrester Jerry, Siruma won second place in Best Mangrove Award by BNRB call last June. And their mangrove management spearheaded is notable because it's it's being managed by women of zero. Next slide, please. So this is the track of Typhoon Pinta. Needless to say, Bicol is a typhoon struck region and people unfortunately are already used to it. However, now that we already established how important these natural buffers, I mean the mangrove, the community resilience is specific to typhoon and storm surges and as climate change mitigation as well program with its blue carbon. 
then it would be best to start designing where to place which. Where's the strategic placement of mangroves to maximize growth and optimize water quality and productivity? That is the engineering perspective in all of this natural resources management. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, Miss Kim. Now we move to the open forum. Questions from the floor. Um, maybe uh, Ina, Ma? maybe uh, Lisa, Lim, and team can start thinking about the questions that they got from the class last yes. night. Lisa? Mm -hmm. Although some were already mentioned in the lecture. Thank you for that, Dr. Lisa. No, mm -hmm. but Doc Lester yeah. can summarize it again. Yeah. Uh, well, I asked um, I asked uh, Mr. Aaron Tustamante, our program manager, also a graduate of DSA, to uh, consolidate the questions, and then he will answer them. And then, if, if we we need, we will support them. Is that would that be okay? Yes, I think. Okay. That would really be you know like a conversation, an exchange. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, so Aaron, you can. You can start. Hello. Yes, we can see you. Good day to all. Yeah. Is, your, have... vid is your video on, Aaron? Yes, Doc Poirier. Okay. Can everyone yes. see me? Yes, Aaron, we see okay, you. Thank you. So I have consolidated some of the questions from your class and provided some answers. Maybe Dr. Lisa and also Papora Surgery could provide more answers if mine are not enough. <laughs> so for the first question, um, what are the factors do you think are significant to drive the community towards resource management and sustainability for this community? So for me, um, I have identified three factors, three A's. So first is awareness. Um, important, it is very important to increase the community's awareness so that their appreciation would also be increased. And the second would be acceptance. With knowledge of the current situation, they need to accept that it is them who need to take action. And then lastly, adoption or action. So commitment is very important and must be shown through action. Adoption and action by the LGU is essential for community resource management and sustainability. For the second question, should I proceed? Go ahead, Aaron. Okay. So is the idea of common resource of the national level addressed in the community as well? If so, how do they connect this local activity to the bigger picture? Um, for us, actually, the idea of common resource or open access has been discussed in the lecture. It is very much prevalent in the communities. This is why sustainable use of resources must be learned starting from the level of the communities. So that's what we believe in. Yeah, and... and uh... Sorry, Doc Lisa, you're on mute. Sorry. Okay. That's also the reason why we are engaging in uh, in uh, information and education campaign because uh, more or less that this needs to be addressed. That notion of the commons, and we have to also we have to also uh, educate them on what this means because I we, I don't think that the notion of the commons is bad. It's just that we need also to uh, emphasize. The responsibilities that are attached to it and we, we it's going to be a very long process uh, we know but we have to start and uh, one of our efforts actually is to start them young so part of our information education campaign is uh, to get the children also to to be aware and sensitized about their mangrove uh, resources and also at the same time explain to them uh, the importance of those in their lives and I think to a certain extent, uh, some of our feedbacks that we get from um, from the children that we work with uh, seems to have a positive and you know, a positive promise that uh, somehow things, at least 
some of their thinking are are, are influenced by uh, the uh, by the information campaign that we had. So I'm sorry, Jerry or uh, um, we. Yeah, I think um, what Dr. Lisa also said answers the next question about how we communicate um, or advocate mangrove forest in the city. So what we do is through community engagements, through IECs, and then for children's education. Let me proceed to the next question. So there's also conflict between small scale fishers and commercial fishers um, having both destructive tools. So how does the Philippine government legislative arm interact with this conflict at this moment? So by Philippine law, commercial fishers can only operate um, beyond the 15 kilometer point since the municipal, municipal fishers are for the small scale fishers. So also municip uh, municipal waters are prioritizing municipal fishers for the use of the resources. Also, um, through the projects, um, we have established marine protected areas and reserved areas so that we can limit access for both small scale and commercial fishers. But I think what, what is important in this question is the number of population that we actually relies on small scale fishery. As we see that commercial fishers are have more the tool have more tools to extract uh, resources. So I think the question here is that we need to focus more, think more of the population that rely in small scale fisheries. So going to the next question, um, talking about the adverse effects of COVID nineteen and the impact of climate change, it talks about very interesting holistic strategies to promote resilience for the community. So. The question, um, the person would love to know if it's all done by one implementer and how do these implementers work together to establish co benefit and community-based development and prevent paradox impacts. So um, for ISO or the stage program, um, principal collaboration with different stakeholders is essential for the success. Um, we try to engage different local stakeholders we may not agree all the time with uh, local stakeholders, but we can always work together for one single common goal, which is the common good of the community. So by collaborating, we try to level off our expectations, also level off our goals and interests. Um, just, to, you know, just to add to that, uh, we're at, at present we do have to admit we're still grappling with it, but uh, we're working with the local community and that's also the purpose of the local research teams because the local research teams also are, are uh, stakeholders uh, that can help in terms of addressing those concerns. And we do have some of the members of those research teams that are also now uh, part of the local disaster response management teams of the local government unit, so they are also engaged uh in in terms of you know, in terms of uh providing uh assessments of the situation and also uh involved in um in disaster response in in one occasion for example a local res uh, local community organizer who is from the community is actually telling us that while he is do uh, while he or she some of them are doing their work in terms of uh assisting the local government in disaster response in their in their uh, no, in their own time in their own personal time they're also talking to the community about you see the importance of mangroves in 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 this and the preservation of the, uh, of your resources so in a sense they're doing it informally they they dovetail the program informally uh in their work in the community as well okay, Aaron, sorry. okay so one interesting question um, do the women who plant trees earn income from this activity? Um, actually, no, but they receive um, some form of incentive through rice subsidy for planting mangrove seedlings. Also, maybe Dr. Lisa and Professor Jerry could, could provide more context to that. Jerry, maybe you can answer that.
in participation of the local communities and uh, fisher folk uh, association partners uh, we only uh, put the rice incentive to do the activities but more or less they are volunteer for doing uh, these uh, very tardy activities in the project but uh, the most important is how they really appreciate uh, those natural resources that they need to protect and conserve these uh, uh, natural resources that they have. Okay. Thank you. Uh, simultaneously also, uh, in terms of the subsidy, uh, well, part of that all simply is just to uh, Parang it, it's simply just to affirm that we, our appreciation of their, you know, of their effort. But for the most part, our experience with the women in Siruma and also in our uh, other project areas, uh, we noted that in terms of establishing and maintaining the, the nursery itself, for them, it's something that they enjoy, particularly the women. And uh, uh, their, their feedback was that uh, being part of that, uh, seeing the nursery being established, it, it makes them feel empowered. And they are affirmed also uh, when they, well, this is from their, uh, no, from their uh, sharing, they are affirmed when they see that the mangrove uh, seedlings are growing because it's almost as if uh, they're nurturing it to grow. And um, secondly, also, I think yung, yung psychological and uh, affirmation uh, that they get from, from it comes also from our uh, partners because um, in one of our dialogues with our partners, uh, the women of Surima, for example, has been affirmed with uh, being the only second group that are able to grow pagatpat, uh, sonerasya alba, in nursery. And for them, that, that's an accomplishment that they're proud of. So, so as a result of that, they're also, they are also uh, very, you know, very eager to engage in uh, new ways of or innovative ways of growing pagatpat so they, they they actually experiment on it uh so i think the rice subsidy or the incentive that you provide is only secondary they do understand the importance of the resources uh in their lives okay. thank you dr lim so um, we have talked about um, women engagement in the program but another interesting question is how are the men engaged in the program? Maybe for Sir Jerry and Dr. Ilhan could answer this. How are the men engaged in the program? Actually, uh, yes. Actually, uh, the men uh, in this in Siruma, uh, they are uh, just uh, doing uh, slight uh, labor labor for that because uh, most of uh, party, uh, most of the participants in this uh, project implementation is more on women because uh, their uh, husbands are going to to uh, the ocean to okay. catch, catch fish. So the availability of the, their husbands is not, uh, not uh, like that. But most of uh, the time, uh, women are having uh, to do the activities in mangrove nurseries. Just, just to clarify also, uh, yung fishing in the Philippines is a male-dominated occupation. So when we when we started the project, we didn't really have a gender, uh, ano, gender lens to it. Uh, we went there and, uh, well, primarily uh, we targeted the men. Okay, and But the men, as, as Jerry has mentioned, are always away from their home. So in, mo in most cases, uh, it's the women who participate in, in many of our, uh, no, many of our uh, activities. But at the same time also, uh, because the program is actually household based, uh, when the women participate and learn all of these things, uh, inadvertently we also empower them so that they by themselves are the ones that uh, engage in it and uh, they informed us that uh, at some point they are the ones now that are orienting their men uh, about uh, the importance of uh, mangrove conservation. And uh, again, 
when they begin now to see that uh, well their their efforts are paying off and then their experiments are are enabling them to ano, are enabling them uh, to contribute to conservation they feel empowered so um, so we when we were thinking uh, on in line with that we we also thought that well uh, that's good so we we can also go into women empowerment but our approach more in terms of women empowerment is not so much in terms of directing only our efforts to women. We do facilitate women empowerment uh, by targeting both gender. So, so in terms of orientation, even gender sensitivity orientation, it's not only directed to women, it's directed to two, uh, to men and women as a household. Um, we we are still to uh, no, we are still yet to assess whether it's it's actually empowering the women uh, but to a certain extent i think uh, in terms of uh, community organizations we have now more women having uh, or holding uh, yung, uh, no, the, the leadership of the organizations more than the men they are the ones that are also uh, implementing in social enterprises and for that matter they do help each other but uh i'm i'm still not uh, no, i i would have to be honest in terms of answering we have not really an, uh, assessed whether uh we are no we have we have been uh addressing young uh gender differences um well one of their jokes really is that uh well we in in the community we uh we don't really feel that there's an you know, there's there's uh, an equal gender role but of course that's that's an answer that needs to be interrogated more so and we we are still going to do that we have not yet uh, actually assessed that but the program itself is directed to men and women not just for men because we're we're targeting households Okay, so I think the, those are the last of the written questions. So maybe, uh, uh, Emma, do you want us to, uh, to address yes. the, the ones in yeah. the chat? Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, my students, they are all there listening to you and have learned a lot from your uh, illustrative uh, cases. So, hey guys, you're there, it's your turn to engage and to converse with our experts here. Ina, can you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. While we're waiting for uh, for um, chat, actually there's one chat here, an interesting question about the gender perspective. Has gender mainstreaming been adopted and what's their cultural perspective in gen on gender in Siruma? Yeah, as I mentioned, we, we we have not actually uh, framed it as gender mainstreaming. Uh, the, the project itself is uh, an environmental project, but again, as I mentioned, uh, as part of our uh, no, as, as part of our efforts, uh, yung de facto kasi because the men are outside, the women are the ones that are being trained and organized. So in a sense, they also are the ones that uh, become empowered. To a certain extent, mm -hmm. and uh, I think they bring it. Uh, they bring it to their household as well, because we do. We do have certain sharing. For example, that uh, before, uh, before we used to just simply follow uh, what what our husbands and uh, uh, other male members of uh, of our families are telling us. But this day, we know that we can do something. So therefore. Uh, we are. We can also assert. Okay. So, uh, in fact, uh, one of our leaders of our water project is a woman, and uh, she she she's she's the one actually that that I know, uh, sort of planning how how they're going to uh, improve their water system and all other things. He she's also the one that um, that's very much involved in terms of uh, mangrove reforestation. In fact. Uh, pressuring even some of the community members to participate in it. So uh, I really cannot say if it's gender mainstreaming at this point, but 
we are we are also going to try to uh, study it further if you want. I think Lisa. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Lisa. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. I, I think what's happening really, I, in my experience with working with uh, women's groups, is that yes, the capacity building of the women starts from there, but really, it mm. she also creates a chain of of chain right. within yes, right. within herself. You know, the capacity building allows her to articulate better, to know, you know, her own roles in the household and in the community. And at the same time, it really starts a chain of the division of labor, in fact, within the households, as mm -hmm. well as in the community. The community right. management roles that the women assume changes actually everybody, even how they, you know, uh, how they you know, get the children to participate in the community activities like that. So um, I, I think uh, the class will have other ideas. I, I think it's not really a holistic list, diba? It really mm -hmm. happens as a family and it's a community, diba? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but again, as I mentioned, I cannot answer categorically because we have not studied it yet. So well, I would not be able to uh, tell you that uh, this is the result. Uh, we see it as we just simply see it at this point that this is what's happening. Yeah. So, but we have to document. <laughs> to, to the class, to the class, we will discuss later because I have made evaluations of gender and housing, gender and community development, reproductive health, and the like. So, we, we can discuss that later. But and we can actually work together in that, Lisa, in terms of, you know, um, looking that really it seems like that it focuses on the women. But actually, mm. it, it transforms everybody. Yes. In the yes. family and in the community. Yeah. That's right. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Mm -mm. I, there's one question here that I want to answer, I guess, in the, uh, no, in, in the chat box from uh, Maria Raisa. Yeah. Yeah, because he asked uh, um, about... Um, I lost it. Um, about the reorientation of Fisher Folks and Sustainable Practices. How do we do this without seeming like we're external experts colonizing the way of life that they have gotten used to? Uh, what is a good and respectful way to do it? Um, let me answer that by uh, calling attention to your local research teams, because the local research team is a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, group, which includes also the Fisher Folks. So uh, and when when we do uh, when we do that we we started first with of course an orientation of how do you do this research but uh, more or less also at the same time uh, getting them to see them for themselves okay that this this is the consequences of uh, your uh, no, the utilization patterns that you have you can see them uh, yourselves so you do the analysis so. So when we, when we do the uh, community resource assessment, uh, community resource ecological assessment, it is both a research and an orientation and awareness building process. So that in process, we don't need to actually um, tell them that what their no, what what their practices their practices are wrong, okay? Uh, or for that matter that there is a need to change it. Uh, we, we allow them to see it themselves. Uh, let the data that they gather themselves speak for itself. Okay, so we simply just provide them the tool on how, how, do, you, how do you analyze these results? Okay, so you don't, uh, the technical part of it, give it to the expert, but in terms of what are the implications of this, of uh, these results are, you need to interpret it yourself. And, and we thought that it worked. Because uh, when, when they do the planning, you can see them that they, they, they are the ones that are actually uh, arguing uh, to the local government units and to other, and not to other stakeholders that, uh, well, this is what the data is saying to us and we need to change. So, so they can argue it uh, among themselves and also see them uh, and uh, do some, uh, not, do some uh, planning for themselves and how they can address the situation. Um, 
So I, I think that that's that's the thing that they are telling us <laughs> because we don't really have that much money. So so what they tell us is that the thing that we like about you is that even though you don't have money, you allow us to see things that we we were not able to see before. Okay, so and it helps us also in terms of uh, in terms of how we're going to address our own concerns and our own situation. So, which for us is uh, well, relatively we are very affirming as well. <laughs> Uh, see. Okay, so I guess we can uh, take one more question um, before we formally close the webinar. Okay, so yeah, but uh, which of those in the chat box do you want us to answer? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There's actually one sent last night. Um, it's yeah. about. It was shown, she says, it was shown in the video that the community is dedicated to the reforestation of mangroves for the next generation mm -hmm. and to protect their main source of. This is connected to what um, was this, what was mentioned by Dr. Porio. Um, with that, are there initiatives that involve the youth in Siruma to mm -hmm. also equip with the necessary knowledge and skills of CBCRM? Yeah, you can answer More that. on youth. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, actually, we started uh, tapping with the youth in Siruma since 2018. And uh, in 2019, with uh, one of our funding agent, uh, project partner, the uh, K Dundren, the KNCF project, uh, we are doing the IEC uh, campaign for the youth. And we are incorporate the uh, CBCRM component, and we try to. Uh, they are trying to uh, mainstream it in their, their uh, uh, new normal uh, class. Uh, but uh, but of course, uh, it's not formally uh, formally uh, mainstream from their uh, lectures. Yung, yung, I suppose uh, yung answering that uh, in terms of the next generation kasi uh, as you mentioned, we do information education campaigns but that's also the reason why we targeted the children uh, because the children are your second generation so so uh, they, they, they need to see what's happening and also uh, make them sensitive to their environment. One of our experience, that, uh, one of the experience that we had was that uh, when we had the children and the parents do their dialogue, uh, we had some children telling their parents, you know, father or mother, uh, we feel bad that you're cutting mangroves. So uh, we, we hope that you would not do it again because you see it's compromising our future. And I think that was a very powerful argument coming from the children. Okay? And that, that actually is the reason why they are concerned about it. Uh, because then they begin to see that their children also are affected and that the children knows it at this point. Uh, so, so I suppose um, in terms of approach, I thought that the youth and the adult dialogue, after, for me personally, actually really worked. <laughs> okay, and, and, and we reach a lot of parents that way as well. Uh, and also, uh, I know, uh, also uh, the educators, right, Jerry? I mean, we had we had uh, we had educators telling us that uh, it's good that you are, you are, no, it's good that you're doing this for our children because you know we're very, uh, we're, we're very, we have a lot of things to do. We cannot address that anymore. And so, so, uh, and uh, the children also appreciate being uh, brought to their mangrove areas because they now. Uh, see uh, what what exactly it is, and then uh, getting them to know even just a simple uh, just a simple uh, that they they know the names and uh, the attributes of mangroves. Iba Jerry, they feel that yes. they they develop certain affinity to it already. Actually, so, uh, Doc Lisa, uh, the the youth of uh, Siruma is uh, try to appreciate more on what is uh, mangroves, uh, mangroves, importance of mangroves in their lives. So it's the same as what uh, doing or, or uh, what could be the 
the older one who are uh, try to appreciate, uh, but also in the youth uh, concept. Um, I think yung, um, when you, yung children, the educational children, um, they they begin to see the importance because, uh, like for example, they they know uh, well this 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 species is actually what we use for our homes or, or constructing our home. So if, if we deplete this, then we won't have anything to construct our home with. So simple things, simple things like that. So uh, we we do want to continue it for other ecosystems. Uh, but of course, we're still looking for you know, resources for that. Uh, we, we want to develop a systematic module of uh, children's education and also back to back with adult education and community information education campaigns on the importance of mangroves. Uh, and answering also, uh, because I think see, Dr. Rafael is actually raised a very good issue in terms of. Uh, the efforts in um, community management, where um, some of our efforts can actually uh, how, how 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 do we address the the no, yung mga larger structure that are at work there? Uh, I'm not so sure if we can uh, in the short run, but what we're doing actually is like in Siruma, for example, uh, yung yung uh, fish ponds are uh, at the hands of uh, big uh, no, no, uh, of outsiders and also um, people that that own large tracts of land in the community. So what we do is that we we uh, or also illegally encroach lands for that matter. So what we do is uh, through the participatory research, we were able to identify those uh, those uh, no, those individuals and uh, institutions. So we set up meetings with them, set up dialogues with them, with the community, and in process also uh, present to them that hey, uh, there are certain laws that you are violating. So we, we give you options. You either participate uh, as far uh, and uh, participate in our efforts, uh, and at the same time also uh, work in terms of developing enterprises That's where everybody would probably be able to benefit, or we can always invoke the legal, ano, the legal uh, regulations, okay? And and uh, since we have partnership also with BNR and uh, the Bureau of Fisheries, we can always invoke that your fish fund be you know, be subjected to regulation. And in in some cases, we're able to persuade them, uh, uh, but Again, um, our main concern at this point is that we need to demonstrate that it's going to work, that private partnership would work. Uh, because I think for some of them, they're, they're, also, uh, no, they're also at the stage of wait and see. We will participate, we will, we will, uh, uh, we will cooperate with you as long as you can tell us that it would work. So, so we're now in that process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lizalim, for Sir Gary and Sir Iron for all the uh, knowledge you shared with us this morning. Um, so to officially close the session, I will call back now Dr. Emma Porio, main convener of the Climate Resource Management and Human Development webinar. Dr. Emma. Yeah. Thank you, Ina. And thank you, Lisa, Jerry, Aaron, and um, Kim. Um, as I always tell my class, there's really nothing, there's only little bit natural about natural resource management. Resource management strategies are social, politically, economically, and culturally constructed. As I always uh, tell them, the social geography is power in the community and beyond, the local and natural uh, national governments, the markets beyond the community, they shape the social, political, economic relations within the village and their access, uh, use, and uh, control of resources. So as I remind my students, remember the three Gs in social transdisciplinary development, gender, male and female, Others, uh, genders, 
generation, old and young, geography, the geographies of power economically, socially, culturally, and politically. So I, 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 every time I listen to Lisa and other groups, I always read something, you know, I those things, but really what struck me is that we can make things possible. If there is community organizing, there is solidarity networks form, and there is uh, an acceptance of what have we done to the environment and what can we possibly do? And I really like Lisa, what you said about the dialogue between the young and uh, their parents, no? Or the dialogue between husbands and wives, or the, like that. Th those are, I, I find that the community teach us a lot of things. We can do things if we facilitate and we just sit there as a facilitator. Not, I mean, I was struck basically by one question about colonizing. I, I like the word that you use because I think a lot of times people who well-meaning do good come to the community, they don't realize that they're colonized, they're bringing with them their own life worlds, and they are colonizing the life world, the local life worlds. I think we have to bring in the transformation, sensitive of each other's positionalities of power, positionalities of access to resources, and how do we craft a sensitive, resilient, sustainable pathway? So thank you very much, Lisa, I really, and Aaron, and um, Jerry and Engineer Kim, you know, guys, uh, I've been working, you know, I work, started working AMs ago when I evaluated the local resource management. Remember that, Lisa? L Lisa was a program officer at the National Economic Development Authority of the local resource management. I, I, you know, I, that really taught me a lot. And if you're interested, you know, Lisa's work really uh, gave me a chance to produce. There's a, if you Google, there's a monograph called Partnership with the Poor and the Approach to Local Resource Management. And I'm very happy looking at all the things that you guys are doing in Calabanga. I mean, this is what, this is our dream list, no? Aeons oh. ago. <laughs> Aeons yes. ago. So uh, I, I would Come say. Up with them and yeah. So, so thank you oh. very much. I, I think. Uh, our session one, meaning our uh, climate resource management and um, community lecture series 2020 is off the good start. I, I, in fact, I was talking to our CRPH advisor, Dr. Toby Dairit, and I said, I really will get the community initiatives on the ground connected to the issues here in the urban poverty, urban development and the like. So I'm also quite excited. We are going to partner with Lisa in terms of doing a climate school, you know, in Colón and perhaps here in the city. So thank you very much. And I would like to say that, you know, to those um, outside uh, viewers, we have, I said earlier, you're having a hard time in the live streaming because of the uh, the weather, but we will put all our, you know, lectures and presentations in our CCAR page YouTube channel. Okay, so watch out for it. And thank you very much for joining us. I would like to take this opportunity, by the way, Lisa, to thank Father Robert mm -hmm. Rivera, the president of Ateneo Dinaga, our partner, the CCAR page partner in uh, Ateneo Dinaga and Dinaga City Resilience School, because it's because of partnership with Ateni Dinaga that we, you know, Engineer Kim applied as a research intern. So by the way, all people were, we still have research internships uh, in the Sikar PH. And so I would like to thank, um, if Father Robert is listening now, I'd like to thank his team. They were able to produce the scientists at Ateni Dinaga work with the local government unit and the communities, the 28 barangays in Nagas, to produce the climate disaster risk assessment map. So that's really um, a team of scientists, 
of local government officials, of communities, uh, trying to come up a map that they can use. So thank you very much. I, I hope you will join again on Thursday, uh, same time, nine o'clock. And in that, uh, we are fortunate to have Miwako Hosoda, the Vice President of the uh, Shisa University in Japan, to talk about you know, the Bhutan Green School and all the initiatives in Japan. We're also fortunate to have been joined um, by Father Steve Redelias of the Laudato Si Philippines and of the Caloroiga Experiment together with Professor Raymond Lucero at the University of the Philippines Open University. So thank you very much. We will um, put in our CRPH YouTube channel the recording of this uh, conference. So thank you, Lisa. I, re I think uh, Lisa and the team, I always tell people, it's through the intellectual generosity of the people who are working with us that things are possible. Okay, thank you. <laughs>